How you doing guys? Want to maybe do maybe a three part series. We'll see how far I can cover throughout this video. Uh, going to cover some traditional knife terms. If you're new to traditional knives or you're thinking about maybe putting one in your watch pocket because of course with the cold weather that's coming up, it's blue jean weather. So you can fill your watch pocket up with something sharp. That's always fun. Uh, I've found that they really cut very well. The very slim uh, blade stock and usually high flat grinds, if not full flat grinds on slip joints. You guys already know this on your Swiss Army knives, how great they slice. Um, and then just of course they look gorgeous. But anyways, so I'm going to go over some terms because uh, one of the big areas to hang out if you're getting into traditional knives and you can learn a whole lot is over at Blade Forums. They have a traditional knives section where they mostly talk about these old grandpa knives. But these things, man, they've just grabbed me lately. I'll tell you. <laughs> the last few knives I've bought have been uh, GEC. And yeah, I've got about five other knives that I want to put uh, in my collection. And then I'll probably get back out to titanium frame locks and whatnot. Anyways, enough about myself. Let's get to the knives. Some terms, some very, very basic terms. We'll go over that first. If you're brand new to slip joints, uh, this, these are springs. So that determines your action and your snap, right? So the stiffer the spring... Uh, the more it's going to snap. And you'll hear that a lot when you're buying slip joints, old slip joints, um, new slip joints. You know, how's the snap? Snap refers to that. Uh, and you'll also hear about pull weight. So GEC, if you guys are not familiar, is a U.S. manufacturer of these new traditional knives, if that makes any sense. New knives made in the old style on some of the old machines out of Pennsylvania. That's right, they're really historic like that. But anyways, <clears throat> so the walk and talk is how does the blade sound when it snaps? They're all kind of related, right? So this almost snaps open and snaps closed. Of course, this one has a half stop. You'll hear that a lot. Does it have a half stop? Half stop means it just literally there's a square tang on it. And it, it stops right here. It's a safety function. Safety feature, rather. So if I'm holding this knife and somehow I hit it and the blade was supposed to close, I could show you a spine whack test. <laughs> of course it would fail, but here's the thing. If you're just going to hit it, right, it would click into that half stop. And you would get some sort of feeling before you kept going to to hurt your fingers. Anyways, so walk and talk. How does it pull out? Is it nice and smooth? Basically it's just the action but also includes the snap. Right, that sound. So that sounds very different than let's say this case. Right, this one has a little tingier. So walk and talk the talk part's really subjective, you know. If someone tells you, oh, it's got great talk, I mean, that's just the ting it sounds. The ting that it makes when it snaps shut. Uh, pull weight, you'll hear a lot also. So, pull weight is exactly how it sounds. Usually, it's a scale 1 to 10. So, when you hear people talk about, oh, what's the pull weight? GCs used to be terrible. So, 10 being the worst, like, you go to pull this out, and you break your nail off. Bam. Right? Terrible, tear up your nail in, you know, three openings. That would be like a nine. GCs used to all ride right around like an eight. But I got to tell you, these new ones in the past even year, maybe two years, are fine. These, I like a stiff spring because, you know, you don't want it to fold up too easy, right? You want to be able to put some pressure on it, and you want good snap. And, of course, being a spring it will probably lose a little bit of tension throughout its lifetime. So let's say 15, 20, 30 years from now, if you have a knife that's slightly stiff now, uh, hopefully it'll still be good to go and safe to use 100 years from now. You know, And there's some knives that are you know, really old that still have great...
great snap and it's because they you know were a little bit strong when they were first made so anyways i don't think the average person would wear out a let's say a seven pole to a five pole within their lifetime so really you don't have to worry too much about it it's usually just a personal preference uh, i just tend to like the little bit heavier i like my poles right around seven right so it's stiff to open Still gives a nice crisp snap. I think this queen is perfect. This thing is strong. Um, anyways. Gorgeous. Alright, I gotta speed this up, but I want to make it educational. We went over walk and talk. Uh, snap, pull. Alright, nail nicks. There's a few different ways to do nail nicks. So you'll see there's literally a nail nick like you're used to on all your case knives all the your Swiss Army knives don't have to go over that it's literally just a portion to get your nail into uh, on fancier knives or upscale or or higher end more dressy knives you will see what's called a long pull Some people like it, some don't, but you can see it's a channel along the whole knife. I think it just gives it a little more classy feel. And also, if you don't like to particularly grab it right here, you can grab it down here and grab it up here. You know, either way. But usually that's found on fancier knives. And you can see these uh, slip joints can also have swedges. That's just like our tactical knife terms. A lot of them are full flat grind. And uh, we'll get into, because I have this one in my hand, pinched bolsters. So maybe you can see these little indentations here. Usually that's found on higher end knives as well. Some people like it, some don't. Um, I like them, but they don't, my knives do not have to have pinched bolsters. I think this is gorgeous, just completely smooth. And the same with this trapper here. <clears throat> I'll make another video on patterns. I do not have all the patterns because all the patterns don't interest me. Uh, but anyways, I can give you guys a good overall once over if you want to hear about that a little bit later. Okay, so another thing about bolsters while we're talking about it would be the term threaded bolsters. So sometimes if you're over in the forums the traditional nice form you'll see people talk about threaded bolsters that is this right here usually found on upscale knives this is a single thread bolster so you can see that one groove right there and if uh, I don't have any examples here sure don't um, but anyways, a rat-tailed bolster would be if you cut this way down real deep. Uh, or also known as like a fluted bolster. Uh, Tony Bowes, his knives usually feature that real deep cut in the bolster. And it's just a really striking look that I think just looks incredible. Uh, but those are some of the bolster terms. You'll also hear the term bareheaded. Bareheaded means it does not have a cap on the end of the knife. So this knife would be called a bareheaded single blade trapper. It has a bolster up here, no bolster in the rear. In slip joints, that bolster in the rear is called a cap. So this would be the bolster on this knife. This would be the cap. Again, this version would be bareheaded. As would this. This way back is bareheaded. So, anyways. Yeah. Okay. We can go over this too. Well, I guess this would be more into maybe styles of knives. Uh, this long bolster here is usually characteristic of <clears throat> a Barlow knife. Whoops. Usually Barlow's have this long front bolster. They're usually pretty sturdy knives uh, made for 
work, you know, kind of beating up on them. Usually they're logoed with some sort of company name or Barlow or something up here. Originally they were supposed to be like the cheap work knives that the everyday man would put in his pocket. The longer bolster was there uh, to improve the build quality, the toughness, right? Just make it a little more stout. Usually the bolsters in a nice Barlow were the same steel as the the blade. Not always, but usually it wasn't like nickel silver. Again, being a cheaper work knife, uh, they were usually made out of some sort of carbon steel. Um, sometimes stainless, but sometimes they could um, take on a patina just like the blade. Sometimes they'd rust up. And this particular Tom's Choice Barlow by GEC is not stainless steel it's not nickel plated or nickel silver or whatever uh, this can certainly take on a patina which I think is kinda cool you know I'll take it another thing in higher end slip joints and this is not always the case but you can see how this has steel liners maybe if the lighting will cooperate right and this particular one <clears throat> oh, that really threw off the lighting here let's see this one right here maybe see how that has brass so it goes brass it goes actually <laughs> while we're here we can talk about that as well in traditional knives this is not called a scale this is called a cover so this has bone covers right this uh, has ebony covers um, anyways I don't know why they're a little bit different but they certainly are so it goes cover, brass, spring, brass, right, spring. This has a nice sandwich look, and I kind of like that. You know, not to say I don't like this nice seamless look here, but the sandwich look is kind of cool too. So, at any rate, while we're up and close like this, you want to, when you're buying a new slip joint or if you're, uh, whatever at the flea market checking out some of the older ones or whatever you want to make sure you're looking for no gaps in the back spring of course you gotta consider cost as well GEC is what I'm showing you here they do a great job really nice fit and finish everything all the bolsters line up nice that can be for another video let me show you an example that maybe isn't so perfect which doesn't bother me. This is about a $70, $75 knife from Queen. Made out of D2 steel. Right, we can talk about that later. Usually traditional knives have some sort of carbon steel that take on a nice patina over time. This D2, uh, pretty rust resistant. I don't think it's going to take on much patina. But anyways, let's check out this See if you can see that that hairline gap from here to here does not affect the function of the knife at all. There, maybe you can see it right there. Right, uh, this is just for collectors, people like you and I who really, really get into this stuff. You really don't want a gap there. Doesn't affect anything, but you know. And you also want to try to look for blade centering. That's another term you'll hear, blade rub. So I don't know if you guys remember seeing this one. This is the Swayback Jack. It doesn't rub, but when I sometimes will dig it out of here, it has a little bit of blade rub. Usually these single blades and the double blades, you know, you don't have to worry too much about it. I'm going to show you a Stockman though. You see it does that. Again, doesn't really affect the functioning of the blade. Let's show you the stockman where it can get a little funky and usually expected is in a stockman pattern where they have all these blades crammed in this little frame. You're usually going to get some sort of rub. It's really incredible how they can do this. They kind of grind this blade off center and crooked so it sits it doesn't hit this pen blade here but anyways I believe that pen blade kinda grabs the side of the frame here 
Again, you got to take in consideration price on a Tony Bowes custom. You wouldn't want that, you know. But on a $70 case, maybe to be expected. So, yeah, lots of options. We can go over patterns on the next video. There's tons of cool stuff, tons of new exciting stuff, new frames actually coming out. Uh, what I mean by frame is just a style. So you may find in your traditional knife search, you may find you really like this bullet and jack style frame, this teardrop. They call it bullet end because of this cap portion here. But you may really like this, but you don't like this cover. Or maybe you don't like the spear blade and you want a regular clip blade, like a conventional... Oh my gosh, this is about the closest thing I have to a clip blade. And you want this style. You'll find it in this frame. There's lots of options. Lots of options. So anyways, that's it. That's kind of the crash course. We went over the single thread bolster, pinched bolsters, covers, bareheaded. This would be a bareheaded lockback, right? No cap on the end. Long pull, a uh, little bit of fit and finish stuff. Of course, you want to make sure your covers match up to your bolsters. Um, pull weight. I like around a six or a seven pull. I don't want it to be too easy, but not too stiff, you know but a little more stiff than easy if I had the choice and of course you guys probably know this is the shield real cool fact not trying to sell you on GC knives or anything but GC the Great Eastern Cutlery still pins all of their shields where Case has even taken to just gluing them in which really Probably never an issue, but it is nice to know that there's a solid peg all the way through and um, holding that shield on. It's kind of something neat. So that's it, guys. We can go over frame, um, different patterns and stuff because I know a lot of people get confused. And I honestly, I'm still learning stuff every day. I think a lot of people are. Um, but that's it. This is an easy open cutout. So you can pinch it open. That's usually a big plus. People like to be able to pinch their knives open. Then you have all your different blade. We can do that in the other video too. Different blade uh, styles. Which you guys probably mostly already know. Very pinchable. That's a term you hear too. Is that knife pinchable? This is the Swayback Jack. Not pinchable. There's no way you can get on there and pinch it open. You gotta use your thumbnail. That's it, guys. Hopefully, you have a good day. Have any questions, please post them below, and I can do my best to try to answer them. Again, I don't know everything. Learning as I go. But I know it's pretty intimidating, especially if you're getting into them. You're just starting off, and you don't know where to go, where to look, any of the terms, anything you might even remotely be interested in. How in the heck do you carry a knife with no pocket clip if you're, you know, a pocket clip guy? Believe it or not, these traditional knives pair up really well with your modern tactical folders. Like I said, watch pocket. I really, when I try to buy, uh, when I'm buying my traditional knives, I try to make sure they're small enough to go in my watch pocket. That way I know they'll get carried and used. So That's it. Just my personal preferences there. Let me know. I can do in-depth reviews on any of these if you guys wish. We're going to catch you guys later. Have a great day. See ya.